he had taken his homework for the he next did day. his homework and submitted for the next day. He took out a snack that he never ate. He started to take out garbage that he never finished. We counted about 17 things like that that were odd for Sean. Today I want to talk about Sean Doherty. Sean was found dead in his home in a very tragic, horrible, awful way, but the circumstances of his death, like the scene and the investigation, have many people, including his own parents, questioning the official story. The official story is that Sean did this to himself, but there are many unexplained details of the case, such as the way his hands were tied and the way the crime scene was processed, what happened during the investigation. The thing is, Sean's parents and the police have different versions of events of what happened in crucial parts of the investigation, which has only led to more speculation and obviously conspiracy theories. And the parents want people to talk about this and find out what really happened to Sean. The police are like, it's done, it's over, we should just end it now. So I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I want to give you guys the facts then we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. So the whole thing started on April 14th, 2022. It was around 4.30 p.m. when Maria came home and the thing is, is that Sean, who's 12, he was supposed to be babysitting his younger brother, who's two. And the reason why is because his mom, Ramona, she was at a doctor's appointment. She was taking her mom actually to a doctor's appointment. And then Sean's stepfather, Jared, he was out with another son and he was also at an appointment. And then the daughter, Maria, the one who just came home at 4.30, she was at a tennis match. And apparently this appointment was only supposed to take like 25 minutes. So they had Sean with the little boy for you know around half an hour, that was the plan. But then when Maria came home, she was knocking on the door and no one was answering. She started ringing the doorbell, no one's answering. She starts calling Sean's phone. He doesn't pick up, texting, no response. So she starts to worry, she calls her mom. She's like, listen, I'm here, no one's answering. Sean's not answering. And the mom tells her, you know, maybe he's playing video games or like the TV's on really loud and he can't hear you, he's not near his phone. Why don't you go to the backyard and then from there, maybe there's like a back door that's open. Well, Maria goes to the backyard and she basically is shocked from what she sees. What does she see? She sees her little brother basically hanging from the swing set. And the way he was hanging was really weird because first of all, his she, she said his legs were dragging, like they were dragging on the ground and he was barefoot but his feet were clean. Then he had like a helmet bag, uh, like a motorcycle helmet bag around his neck and it was tied by like a string. Another thing Maria noticed when she saw Sean hanging was that his glasses were broken and on the ground near him. And then his hands were tied really tight next to him, his arms and hands with a belt. So Maria freaks out, she runs, she tries to like lift him up to relieve like the pressure from his neck and call 911 at the same time. They instruct her to like put him down and give him CPR and she's doing that and she's waiting for the paramedics to arrive. When the paramedics arrive, they actually are the ones who undo the belt that is around Sean and they had a hard time taking the belt off. It was that tight. So they try to resuscitate him. It's not working. They are going to take him to the ambulance. Now keep in mind there were some weird things because Sean was not wearing his clothes. The clothes he was wearing that day. He was wearing an adult male's clothes. A dress shirt, like trousers. He's wearing a man's clothing. Then the mom shows up, Ramona. She pulls up and she sees her daughter hysterically crying. She sees ambulance and police cars. She's like, the worst has happened and they tell her like, you know, he was found hanging. We're going to take him to the ambulance, to the hospital, sorry, in the ambulance. And she's like, where is the two-year-old? So she's running through the house looking for the two-year-old and she finds him hiding under like a pile of laundry that's like on a chair. He's hiding underneath there and she said he seemed out of it. Like an exhausted doll. He opened his eyes, he was all sweaty. It looked like he had been crying. Limp, 
Okay, so that's weird. She takes the little boy and they go follow uh, Sean who's on his way to the hospital. She calls Jared, the stepfather. He's like, I'm at the doctor's appointment. I'm like 40 minutes away. Like, I'll meet you guys there. And they all get to the hospital. And unfortunately, Sean doesn't make it. So the police then tell them at the hospital, the family, they're like, okay, we're going to process the scene. So we need you to stay at a hotel until we're done processing the scene. So they do that. So remember, Maria came home at 4.30 p.m. and all that happened. By midnight, that same night, the police call the family and they tell them, we're done processing the scene, you guys can come home. So the family comes home, and as soon as they come home, they realize that there are things that they feel should have been taken and processed as evidence. There, it just They found a lot of weird things. First thing they notice is there's like a handprint that was out of place. I froze because I was like, that's a huge handprint on the door. That's not Sean's. Hand was not from the outside, but from the inside. And it was the left hand. And they said that there was like residue, didn't appear that it was lifted. They come inside to the kitchen and they see there's like a peach in a bowl, like someone made a snack, but they didn't eat it. They see trash bags, their trash bags, filled on the ground as if someone was going to take the trash out and Sean's Crocs on those trash bags. Remember, he was found barefoot, but the trash bags weren't taken by police. Then they notice other trash bags, but these aren't their trash bags because they said their trash bags have red strings and these trash bags have blue strings and they're ripped up and they're also just sitting there. So that's this is not even the worst part because then they go upstairs. When they go upstairs into the master bedroom, they find Sean's underwear on the floor. I literally almost walked onto Sean's underwear. They were there. Sean never, ever in his life has taken his underwear off in my bedroom. There's no reason for it. And the mom says she like put a tweezer, like grabbed it, put it in a Ziploc bag to preserve it so that she could give it to police. Then they see that the dresser drawer has been like rummaged through and they realize that the clothes that Sean was wearing were his stepfather's clothes, Jared, from the dresser. But his clothes were missing. His t-shirt and the shorts that he were wearing were missing. They've never been found yet. So what happened to the, so in, at this point, like they're all thinking, oh my God, somebody did this to Sean. Like, where's his clothes? Who put him in this outfit? Like what happened, you know? So they're calling the police. They tell them they found, they said they also saw some like blood spatter or something that looked like blood spatter. I saw some splatters that seemed like small blood things that I asked them to collect. Sean definitely had blood on when I did the picture on his hand, but the physical uh, officer, she washed it off. The other thing the family noticed that was odd when they came home was that the thermostat was up really high. It was like set to 85 degrees um, and that's not at all what they would usually set it to. And so they were just like, what? Like, what is going on? Why? Why is the thermostat up high? And according to the family, the next day, the an officer does come out and lifts like the, the handprint and takes the pieces of evidence. Uh, but then this is where there's conflicting stories because on one hand, the family saying that they told them we found a print, like we were able to lift the handprint, but we ran it through the system and there wasn't a match. But on the other hand, they're, they're, you're hearing them say, well, the the handprint was no good. We couldn't actually use it. So we didn't even run it. So this is when things start getting even weirder. The family knows that there are neighbors that have security cameras that are pointed like in the backyard. And so they were asking about you know, what's on the camera footage. And the cops are like, well, those cameras don't really work. And we talked to the neighbors and they said they didn't even hear anything. So we don't really have any information about that. Like we can't really help you. And then about like the pictures and the findings, the family said they never heard back from the police about anything, what they found or, or anything like that. Then 
according to the family. Remember the two-year-old that was hiding under the pile of laundry? They say that he started telling them a story. He started telling them that the day Sean died, that Sean's friend came over and was punching him. So at this point, the family is convinced that like somebody did this to Sean and they're just really hoping that the police are gonna find out who did it to Sean. Then the autopsy was released. And this is where it all goes downhill because the medical examiner says in the autopsy that the cause and manner of death is suicide by hanging. But the medical examiner notes that there was no suicide note as well as the fact that there was, quote, no known history of depression or suicidality. And it says that they, they don't know of any bullying, but that the police are investigating possible instances of bullying that could have led to this. Now, according to Sean's family, they, they do know of one incident of bullying that happened. Family says there was one instance in December of 2021. Remember, he was found dead April 2022, so months ago. Um, and they say that it like he wasn't that upset by it, but they do acknowledge that there was an incident. And then also there's conflicting information about the suicidality because although the medical examiner said there was no known history, the ER doctor, okay, in his notes wrote, quote, that Sean had a history of suicidal ideations. First of all, why are they conflicting? And second of all, their investigators did not find anything to support that he did have suicidal ideations because they took his phone, his iPad, and his computer. And they say that usually, usually, not always, of course, but usually when someone commits suicide, they are searching uh, things up. And when someone says that you have ideations, it's because you're Googling like ways to do it or you're writing about doing it, you're sending messages about it, something. Uh, but they couldn't find anything like at all. But yet the ER doctor is saying that he has suicidal ideation. So where is that coming from? And why is it conflicting with the medical examiner's report where they say there's no known histories when they would have spoken to the ER doctor or at least looked over the notes, you would think. So to understand the situation a little bit more, let's talk about Sean's short childhood. Sean was born on November 8th, 2009, and his mom, Ramona, and dad, Timothy, they actually separated and they both remarried, but supposedly he had good relationships with both of them. He saw his dad's side and his mom, but he lived primarily with his mom and his stepfather, Jared, and they both, Ramona and Jared, were high-ranking officials in the Air Force and they moved around a lot and so that's also a factor that some people bring up is like well you know he never really felt settled or could make long-term friendships because they were moving a lot and on top of that they were about to move again because his mom just got a job at the Pentagon so they're gonna move um, and so some people were like well maybe you know he already he was he had bullied in school and he didn't have many friends because he was moving around a lot and now they're gonna move again. Like maybe that set him over the edge. Um, but the mom, she said that he was actually very happy about it. I'll read you the quote. Sean jumped up screaming with excitement and said he couldn't wait to tell his friends that his mother worked for the Pentagon. He wanted to know if he could go into the Pentagon and get some of the milk chocolate candies with the iconic building stamped on top. Sean also loved Disney and the family said they just came back from a cruise to Disneyland. They had plans to go to another one and like Sean was so excited about Disney. They were talking about how the night before uh, he was found dead, he was making them laugh and they were having this great time. Like his mom brought home cookies and he was like, nah, like chef's kiss cookies and they all laughed. They said that he told them, uh, good night, I love you. And he quote, bounced down the hall into his room. The next day they said he was in a good mood. And actually his mom spoke to him on the phone an hour before he was found dead. And she said that he was fine, he was in a good mood. So let's talk about the day he was found dead because he completed his homework that was due the next day and he um, spoke to his mom. And then after speaking to his mom, there's an hour of time between when he spoke to his mom and when his sister came home and found him hanging. During that time, 
it is believed that that's when he made the snack, he packed up the trash, and something happened. Did he put on the clothes? Did someone put on the clothes? Did he get attacked? Did he hang himself? All of that stuff happened within that hour. Nobody really knows like what actually happened. The only version of events, the only story that's ever been told is from the two-year-old little brother who said Sean's friend came and punched him and was punching him, sorry. So what are we to make of that? Is that, is he making it up? Is the family telling the truth? Is, is he telling the truth? Like where would a kid come up with that? I don't know, it's, it's very strange and so, because of all that information, the background I just gave you, when the autopsy came out, like the parents refused to accept it. And this is when we start to have the clash uh, between the parents and the police. The parents go all out, okay? They, they make a Facebook page called What Happened to Sean. They have signs. They're like putting them all around the neighborhood. They make a GoFundMe to uh, raise money to hire a private investigator. They do a change.org petition to get another opinion from some other bureau of investigation, not that police department. They are talking to the local media. Ramona and Jared Rivas remember their 12-year-old son, Sean Doherty. His stepfather and mother say how he was found is just the first of many questions. He had did, take, homework for he the did his day. homework and submitted for the next day. He took out a snack that he never ate. He started to take out garbage that he never finished. We counted about 17 things like that that were odd for Sean. All those things had to be done by Sean on that one day in a 50-minute time frame for him to kill himself. They were basically doing whatever they could to get attention on the case. They just wanted a second opinion. They just wanted someone else to look at the facts and, and, and see what they felt like they saw. So this is a quote from the stepfather, Jared. He said, we don't want this to be a fight with the York Pocosin Sheriff. All we're asking for is another option. I mean, you hear how we're describing him the night before he passed. We all just got back from a cruise and he got his passport done on Tuesday, April 12th, which he was thrilled about. After all this like media attention on the case, uh, the sheriff's department was getting all these calls from concerned citizens, from the media, uh, they were, their Facebook page was blowing up. So they end up releasing a video statement on their Facebook page. Within the hour, the York Pocosin Sheriff's Office posted a video on its Facebook page. Recent statements have caused concern in the community that the death of a 12-year-old on April the 14th, 2022, has not been fully investigated by the Sheriff's Office and that there may be a killer in our area that poses a threat. Nothing could be further from the truth. It has been the long-standing policy of the York Pocosin Sheriff's Office to not release information relating to cases of suicide, particularly those cases that involve children. We do everything within our power to preserve the privacy of the grieving family. We take these matters very seriously, evaluate all evidence, and consider all possibilities. The York Pocosian Sheriff's Office is aware of a recent social media site created to provide the public with theories surrounding the death of this 12-year-old. Much of the information being posted to this social media site is opinion, innuendo and fabrication, which is not consistent with the evidence that was collected by Sheriff's Office investigators during their investigation. It is the Chief Medical Examiner's responsibility to determine the manner and cause of death which they, the Chief Medical Examiner's Office, determined to be a suicide. In addition, the Sheriff's Office met with the family on multiple occasions and gave them the opportunity to discuss this investigation. Additionally, an offer was made to have a group meeting after the findings of the Chief Medical Examiner's Office that would include the family, members of the York Pocosian Sheriff's Office, and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. As of this date, the family has not expressed interest in scheduling the meeting. Instead, they chose to post this video publicly. The mother said, they have told me a few times that they really don't know how to investigate this kind of murder case because it's really complicated. They have told me a few times that they really don't know how to investigate this kind of murder case because it's really complicated. They don't have the experience. They have never seen something like this before. 
then please do me the favor and turn it over to the state police or FBI who do it all the time. That statement is absolutely not true and was never made to this mother. Our investigators are recognized in the Hampton Roads area as professional, caring, competent major crimes investigators. They have several decades of investigative experience within the division. The investigation divisions consist of graduates of the Virginia Forensic Science Academy, which has certified them as crime scene experts. The videos and photos you see on their social media site are not from the actual scene. They have been fabricated. The blood spatter image depicted in the video was not from the scene. However, we went back to the home on May 20th, 2022, at the request of the family. During that visit, the mother pointed out a red stain on the wall in the upstairs area of the home. Investigators photographed that stain, that stain on that date. Later, investigators reviewed the photographs that were taken on April the 14th, 2022, the day of the tragedy, and that stain was not present on that wall on April the 14th, 2022. In the mother's video, she states that her two-year-old child witnessed the events that occurred in the house. During a recorded interview on April the 14th, 2022, between the mother and sheriff's office investigators, she stated when she left the house the afternoon, that afternoon to take her mother to an appointment, the child was asleep. When she returned home after the tragedy had been discovered, she is quoted as saying to the sheriff's office investigator, quote, thank God he was still asleep, meaning the two-year-old. The information that she stated in her video about the two-year-old has never been disclosed to the sheriff's office. Also during the course of our investigation, DNA samples were collected from the cord that the 12-year-old was found suspended from. The 12-year-old's DNA was the only DNA found on this cord. There is an allegation that members of the YPSO, the York Pocotian Sheriff's Office, washed blood from the 12-year-old. At no point did any member of the sheriff's office clean or remove any blood from the scene or the child. At the hospital, investigators placed bags over the 12-year-old's hands prior to him being transported to the medical examiner's office. This is common practice to prevent the loss of any potential trace evidence. Based on the fact that the family was telling us that neighbors had information that they were providing to the family about possible suspects, our investigators went back to interview those neighbors and none provided any additional information or new investigative leads. The mother states that someone from the York Percussion Sheriff's Office sent her a text that stated, quote, time to move on. I have a text where it says, you know, it's time to move on and live my life. To our knowledge, that statement was never made. We have done some research and have not been able to locate a text message telling the family to move on. The only text similar to this was a text between the investigator and the mother where the mother states to the investigator, quote, it is time to heal. Several theories were presented to the sheriff's office investigators by the family. The first theory provided to the family about what happened that day stated that they believed that this was a burglary and during the burglary, their 12-year-old was sexually assaulted and murdered. Sheriff's office investigators found no evidence of an intruder and laboratory and medical evaluations of forensic evidence sent to the laboratory found no signs of sexual assault. The second theory presented by the family was that this was carried out as a military type operation directed at them, the family, due to their rank in the United States Air Force. We conducted a thorough, professional, and exhaustive investigation. There is nothing whatsoever to indicate that there is a, community, a killer in our community. We still extend an, an invitation to the family to meet with members of this agency and the Office of the Chief of Medical Examiner to discuss the results of the autopsy and our investigation. The reaction to this was mixed, okay? Some people were more convinced now that maybe Sean did this to himself after watching the police video. Other people, not so much. So now you had like a divided group of people. You had people that were like, well, he still didn't just like address what the hands being tied. The belt was tied around my son. Oh, they said, oh, he probably tied it himself and all that. So why there was no DNA on the belt? Four weeks later, taking fingerprints, four weeks later after we raised hell, four weeks later going around the neighbors asking if they saw anything. 
And how come what he's saying is conflicting with what Maria, the sister, was saying when she was the one on the scene because she said his feet were hanging. They said there was a chair and that the chair was moved out of the way to get him down. And which one is it? It seems like there's this tension between the mom and the police. Like, what's going on? In the police video, they repeatedly talk about how the mom has not come to sit with them. The family has not come to sit with them. She's gone to social media to express her concern, but she didn't come to us directly. So they're, they're kind of like saying, well, you should have come to us. We could have dealt with this, but now you've gone to the media and it's like this whole thing. At least that's my interpretation. I, I don't know, maybe that's not what they meant. But other than these two statements, the sheriff's office said, we're not gonna talk any more about this and they said well, the only reason we did this is because people are concerned that there's like a killer on the loose um and there's not because this was a suicide and that's it who do you believe you know that that's where it kind of comes down to because some people are like you know which getting ahead of myself okay those are the facts now let's talk about the theories let's start with the official theory first right it was that sean did this to himself so the main part, the thing that people say like makes them feel like they can't believe it's a suicide is the way his hands were tied. So let's try to like think about this, right? His glasses were broken and they said he really couldn't see without his glasses. So somehow his glasses fell, they broke. He would have had to either well, he would have had to put the bag on and then tie his hands because once his hands were tied, he couldn't put the bag on. So let's say he put the bag on and now he can't see, his glasses are broken, he's, his head is covered, but it's not like when you put the bag on, you're going to immediately suffocate. Like you can take a few breaths before you start suffocating. So could he have put it on and tied himself really tight, really fast, enough for him to do this to himself? you know, tie himself in the belt. That's something that people are asking. And then it's like, what's up with the clothes? Like, why, why are his shirt and shorts missing? Where could he have put them that the police didn't find them? If they're missing like that and they thoroughly searched the home, which they claimed they did, then where are the clothes? A lot of people think someone, whoever did this, must have taken the clothes because there's evidence and then found other clothes. Why they would choose adult clothes, I don't know, but chose the clothes, put them in the clothes, tied them up, and did that to him. So, <sighs> another thing people really talk about a lot are the different trash bags. Remember how there was the the red strings that were the ones in the home and then the like ripped up blue string trash bags. What's that about? So I was trying to think, okay, if what's a rational explanation for that and what i came up with maybe you guys can come up with something too is what if like it was just the cops who left it because they were using trash bags they had an extra trash bag or ripped up some trash bags and they just left it there they didn't have time to pick it up and clean up after it i don't know so the whole suicide theory is it impossible i mean possible that he could have put it on and tied it maybe he practiced a couple times tying the belt without looking and then did it that way and regarding like no planning him doing his homework like yes i would think most suicides are planned somewhat but uh i was doing some research and there is such a thing as impulsive suicide like there are people who who just all of a sudden decide they're gonna do it and they do it and it's more common with younger people and they just kind of make an impulse decision and it's like the most final decision they'll ever make so could something have happened that triggered it that made him decide he's gonna do it he practiced practiced it a few times and then actually went through with it well, the police definitely think so. The next theory I wanna talk about is foul play, like someone did this to him. So there's 
several theories with that because the police mentioned that the family said that there could be like a military connection, like they're targeted because they're high powered military officials or something like that, which a lot of people are like, oh, okay, <laughs> right, you know, like tinfoil hat. But the thing is, uh, I don't know. Who knows what they do and if they feel someone's out to get them, did they do something? I don't know. But there, there really is no evidence that is available to anyone that that's possible. A lot of people think it could have been like a sexual assault thing and the police said that they tested everything and they didn't find any evidence of that. But remember, according to the family, his underwear was left at the home. So how thorough is their investigation? Like, can their words be taken? The, the mom said they said they couldn't do this. Like, I don't know. Is it like just like the worst case of incompetence and the easy thing to do was to say it was a suicide so they just it was lazy police work or the other theory is that it's someone in the police department who's responsible for this or who's covering up for someone or something like that because why else would they do all this right that's a major theory. Like when I was online, I saw so many people saying it's so, like it's an inside job, someone in the police department. It's like something like that because they just can't understand why certain things were done or not done in the investigation. And then there's the story the little boy told, right? About someone, Sean's friend came and was punching him, right? And then there was an incident where he was bullied. Could someone from his school, from the neighborhood, who was out to get him, saw that he was home alone and took the opportunity. And that's who the little kid saw. That's another big one too. A lot of people are like, you know, it could be a combination, right? It could be a bully and their parents are in the police department. It could be a, you know, like there's so many like things that people are saying. Um, but when I go online, you know, in the court of public opinion, uh, I would say it's like 75 to 80 percent minimum believe that there's foul play. And there's a small group of people that are like, mm, he probably did this to himself. So I would love to know what you guys think. Uh, if you want to know what I think, like I'm. I can't say 100% because there's a sliver of possibility he could have done it to himself. I just don't want to say that someone did it from the police department or something, but I'm like, damn, are they that lazy? Like, is the incompetence that bad? That I can believe. I can believe, no, and not just in the police department, but just anywhere in the world, that like, people are really incompetent and they let things slide and they just want the easy way out. And they're like, in their mind, they're like, Eh, they want to believe what they want to remember when I did the Pam Hupp case where they wanted it to be the husband so bad because it was like the easy obvious cut and dry thing and in meanwhile it was Pam all along and she was right under their noses it's like I don't know sometimes people get pigeonholed in what they originally thought and it's hard for them to get out of it so it could be that it could be that um then some people are talking about like the stepfather because of like the fact that he was wearing his clothes, but I don't know, that that would be, that would be like insane. All of it is bad, I don't know. Like, well, is there anything good here? I mean, the kid is gone, but the family feels like they just, that's the other thing too, right? Is, is the family just grieving so badly that they don't want to accept that Sean did this to himself? So another thing I found when people were talking about that he could have done it to himself is the fact that why is this 12 year old babysitting a two year old? There, there's a word that I saw online, per parentification. Like maybe he had so much on his shoulders. They were all talking about, he was so kind. He was so nice. He was the sweetie. Like maybe he just held it all in and just snapped. Maybe he wasn't actually happy to go to, because uh, they were moving to the Pentagon. Maybe he was just trying to make his mom happy and acting like, oh my God, that's great. But like, it was really upsetting him. Maybe the bullying was way worse than he was telling them, but he didn't want to let them know. Maybe, you know, having the responsibility of the trash and the babysitting and all this in the house. Because in the article, it said they were only supposed to be gone for 25 minutes, but we know that it was more than an hour because an hour elapsed when the from when the mom called to when the sister came home and so he was there for longer than 25 minutes so that's something I also noticed um I don't know but 
this is a pretty recent case, but it's looking like it's closed. I, I don't see um, the case being open. Right now, the only people talking about it are like online, you know, social media, but officially I think it's closed unless something comes of that petition. But all my sources are linked down below as usual. I will link the petition in the GoFundMe if anyone's interested. But in any case, um, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.